Apostle Paul was a great missionary. When we think of missionary work, we think of Apostle Paul and the, all the places he went. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17, as he looks at his life, he says, For our great light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Can you imagine that? Apostle Paul says, as he looks at his life, he had but light affliction. And this light affliction was good for him. Now, what were some of these afflictions? In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 28, he says he received stripes. In other words, he was whipped. He was in prison. Oftentimes, he was suffering from death. Threatened with death. Forty stripes save one. Three times he was beaten almost to death. He was stoned. He suffered shipwreck. Oftentimes in many journeys, dangers on the water, threatened with robbery. His own countrymen were attacking him. The heathen were attacking him. Dangers in the city. Dangers in the wilderness. Dangers in the ocean. Dangers by false brethren. Oftentimes he was exhausted. He suffered pain. Hunger. Thirst. Fasting. And on top of all of this, the care for the churches. <laughs> now this Apostle Paul, going through all of this, in volume 4 it says, although feeble in health, he labored during the day in serving the cause of Christ, and then toiled a large share of the night, and frequently all night, that he might make provision for his own and others' necessities. And we talk about health reform. Yeah, we, we talk about, it's amazing. If we're doing something for pleasure, it doesn't matter how much we sacrifice. But when it's time to work, many times we as workers, we say, health reform. <laughs> Apostle Paul worked during the day in Corinth in evangelism. And during the night for his physical necessities. And sometimes all night. Do you think there's some lessons for us? When our ministers feel that they are suffering hardship and privation in the cause of Christ. Now we often talk about the struggles of work as ministers. The sacrifices we make. You know, a few years ago, we were, Brother Radu and I, we were driving to a part in Romania and uh, we were in a blizzard. Snow falling, it's freezing outside. And we arrived to our destination and the people say, wow, you suffered a lot to come here. The snow, the temperature. And my answer was, yeah, we suffered a lot. We sat down in a nice car, we turned on the heater, <laughs> we drove in comfort.
what did we suffer? We did not suffer anything. There was climate control. And we call that suffering? No. When our ministers feel that they are suffering hardships and privation in the cause of Christ, let them in imagination visit the workshop of the Apostle Paul, bearing in mind that, well, this chosen man of God is fashioning the canvas. He is working for bread, which he is justly earned by his labors as an apostle of Jesus Christ. He earned his living from preaching the gospel, but he didn't get paid. In, in, when he was in Corinth, when he began the work in Corinth, Later on, when other brethren brought funds, he went full-time in the ministry. <coughs> but on this particular occasion, there was a necessity, and he cheerfully worked with his hands. Many people tell me, we are going to do self-supporting work. I would rather be self-supporting. And I find that they spend more time supporting self than doing any work. Yeah, I, I understand that. But Apostle Paul was, during the day, full-time in the ministry, and during the night, finding a way to live. At the call of duty, the great apostle would lay aside his business to meet the most violent opposers and stop their proud boasting, and then when he would resume his humble employment. And we call our work sacrifice. <laughs> After all that he does, he says, these are the light afflictions that we go through. What are we suffering? 1 Peter 4, 12 and 13 says that we are to go through fiery trials. Why? It says here, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. I want you to pay attention to this. When we go through fiery trials, what are we to do? What are we to do? It says here, rejoice. Rejoice. Praise the Lord. Why? In the book, Lift Him Up, the reading that we have for this morning, it says, because they are God's workmen ordained for the perfection of character. Trials that come to us when we get so many things happening that we're under stress. The solution is not to say, oh, I need to stop this. <coughs> the solution is to rejoice. Because God has a plan. And what is the plan? John 15, 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Why do we go through trials? So that we can bear more fruit. Yeah, you and I. You and I. In other words, when the cross comes to you, if you want success, embrace the cross. <laughs> yeah, we talk about the cross 2,000 years ago. I'm talking about practically when you and I experience the cross. 
We know this verse, Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them that love God. Do you really believe that? When you go through trials, do you take it that God will work this for my good somehow? Are you going to do that? It does not mean that every trial is from God. No, no. No, that does not, that's not what it means. Some trials people put upon us. In the book, Sketches from the Life of Paul, Paul was imprisoned for Jesus Christ. But he was imprisoned prematurely. The brethren, actually, it says here, precipitated the crisis and hastened the predicted sufferings of Paul, separated him from his brethren, deprived the church of one of the strongest pillars, and brought sorrow to the Christian hearts in every land. It's true. It was premature. The church lost something by their own actions in dealing with Apostle Paul. But you see, Paul believed that God will work it for his benefit. My life today, 93, in every affliction. In what? In every affliction, God has a purpose to work out for our good. Every blow that destroys an idol, every providence that weakens our hold upon earth and fastens our affections more firmly upon God is a blessing. One thing less from this world for me to have to deal with. The pruning may be painful for a time, but afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. And listen to this. Listen carefully. Here, listen. We should receive with gratitude whatever will quicken the conscience, elevate the thoughts, and ennoble the life. Again, this does not mean that everything, every problem comes from God. We sometimes blame God for our laziness and our ineptitude. <laughs> sometimes we're lazy. We don't go to work. And we say, oh, it's God's will. <laughs> no, it's not God's will. Not everything is God's will. When the... When our forefathers rejected the message of 1888, it was not the will of God that the return of Christ was to be delayed. Not God's will for their rejection of the truth. But he works it out for our good if we are willing to accept it. So how do we refocus? Sometimes trials come in our life and we say it's too much. And we sometimes lose our hold on God. How do I refocus back in the right direction? Galatians 6.14 But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. You see, you and I have a cross to bear. Sometimes, you know, you go places and, uh, you know, um, in March I was, uh, we went, I went to Russia and we were up in St. Petersburg. And I was looking forward to looking at St. Petersburg. We had a bit of time to go out and see the city. And due to the travels, I got severely sick. And I needed a break, so I didn't see the city at all. But those are crosses that we take in our life. We, we, we bear those things. But how do we bear them? 
You know, I could sit there and complain about it, and it will actually be longer. <laughs> or you can praise the Lord for an opportunity to reevaluate your life and <laughs> relax a little bit, and next day to be able to recover and go. But how do we embrace the cross? Whether it's getting sick from time to time, whether it's going to a new culture and eating a quite a different food that you have never experienced, and to embrace some things that are not against health reform, okay, but uh, to embrace some things. <laughs> How do you do that? We have to look back cross of Jesus Christ. That's how we refocus. And when you embrace the cross of Christ, what happens? 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. What do you find in your cross? Because Jesus said take up your cross daily. Not just, not just in imagination thinking about the cross of Jesus. But you and I daily are reminded of that cross because we have to take up the cross. But what do you find when you embrace that cross? What do you find? You find the power of God. Do you want power in your life? Do you want power? Embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. Back in the book, Lift Them Up, page 248. When the attention is fastened on the cross of Christ, the whole being is ennobled. The knowledge of the Savior's love subdues the soul and lifts the mind above the th things of time and sense. Let us learn to estimate all temporal things in the light that shines from the cross. There is light. There is power in the cross of Jesus Christ. And when that cross comes to you and me, if you embrace the cross in a practical way, there is power in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, what made it possible for Jesus to endure the cross? Isaiah 53, 11 says, He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. I think of the Garden of Gethsemane. Desire of Ages says, The angel came, not to take the cup from Christ's hand, but to strengthen him to drink it with the assurance of the Father's love. He came to give power to the divine human suppliant. He pointed him to the heavens, telling him of the souls that would be saved as a result of his suffering. You read the rest of this paragraph. When Jesus thought of the souls that he will be saved, that's when he determined to go all the way. Sacrifice what needs to be sacrificed. You and I, how do we refocus? First, we look at the cross of Christ. Then, it helps us understand that we have no real sacrifice. It's nothing. <coughs> and then think of the result of the souls that are saved. That's what gives you the strength and the purpose in life. In light of Calvary, some have felt that the lot of a preacher was hard because they had to be separated from their family. 
I still don't like going away from home. Okay, I understand that. But is that hard? They forget that once it was harder laboring than it is now. I remember when I became a worker, and then later on when I got married, and I had to travel. You know, it was expensive to call home. I limited to one hour per week. One hour per week. And I was in the same country, so it wasn't so bad. And that one hour, I would make a phone call and talk for one hour. And that's it for one week. And now we have Skype. And if we have a conference without internet, we feel deprived. Because every day I want to talk to my wife. And we call this sacrifice. Many preachers seek for an easier lot, a less self-denying position. But brethren, this earth is not a resting place for Christians much less for the chosen ministers of God. Are you hungry for souls to be saved? Are you ready to preach? You know, it says here in Testaments and Ministers, Will my ministering brethren plead with God alone in secret prayer for his presence and his power? Dare not to preach another discourse until you know by your own experience what Christ is to you. Ask your question. Every one of us that are here as delegates, I have a question for you. I don't want you to answer the question to me. I want you to think about the question. Have you truly surrendered your life to Jesus as your personal Savior? That's the question. Have you surrendered? Have you given everything to Jesus Christ? Have you come to the point in your life where you surrender and said, Lord, here it is. Everything. Everything is here. Everything I have. Here it is on the altar sacrifice. Have you considered it a privilege to sacrifice? Have you experienced Jesus personally? Dare not. Don't preach another sermon until you know by your experience what Christ is to you. May the Lord help each one of us this morning so we can have a personal experience with our Lord. So we can be true God's workmen in his kingdom. Amen.